This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Fiscally responsible, financial geniuses, monetary magicians. These are the things people say about drivers who switch their car insurance to Progressive and save hundreds. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states or situations. Every team, every topic, everywhere. This is Believe. My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. Female friendships are very special. Many times these bonds are shown to last longer than any other bonds in a woman's life, whether they're romantic, family, or otherwise. But sometimes, one of the two in a friendship starts to become jealous of their friend for various reasons, and this can develop in a sort of competition between the two, which results in the two becoming frenemies. Researchers have studied this phenomenon and claim that these toxic relationships have three prominent characteristics. The first is being competitive, which is when one views the other as more of a rival to outdo than a friend to support. The second is jealousy in the terms of social interactions or material possessions. And the third is distrust, which is actually a lack of respect and care within the friendship. In the case of Doris Duke and Barbara Hutton, they took this to a whole new level. So settle in, my spooky friends. You are about to hear the crazy tale of two rich women who started out as friends, but their relationship spiraled into becoming the original frenemies. Barbara Hutton and Doris Duke were born within a week of each other in New York City in the United States. Barbara Woolworth Hutton came into the world on November 14, 1912, and she was the heiress of one-third of the estate of retail tycoon Frank Winfield Woolworth. This made Barbara one of the wealthiest women in the world. Doris Duke, on the other hand, was born on November 22, 1912, and she was often called the richest girl in the world. She was the only child of tobacco and hydroelectric power tycoon James Buchanan Duke, and when he passed away, he bequeathed the majority of his estate to his wife and his daughter. This estate would be worth $1.74 billion in today's funds. When Doris's mother died, she inherited an additional $250 million. Let's just say that money was never a problem for both of these women. Both ladies led very privileged lives, but their lives couldn't have been more different. Doris spent her early childhood at her father's 2,700-acre or 11-square-kilometer estate called Duke Farms in New Jersey. When she turned 18, Doris was presented to society at a debutante ball at Rough Point, which was her family's home in Newport, Rhode Island. It was only a few years later that six-foot-tall Doris started to get the large bequests as written in her father's will. As Doris received this money, she used her wealth to travel the world and pursue her interests. One of these interests was singing, and she studied under a voice teacher. She brought this skill with her when she worked in a canteen for sailors in Egypt during World War II. In 1945, Doris became a foreign correspondent for the International News Service, where she reported from various war-torn cities across Europe, as well as she became a writer for the magazine Harper's Bazaar. After this, Doris moved to Hawaii. When there, she became the first non-Hawaiian female competitive surfer. She also was a huge animal and horticulture lover. 
This resulted in her supporting various wildlife refuges and created what she named Duke Gardens in Somerset County, New Jersey. These gardens were part of Duke Farms and were designed and planted by Doris herself. She created it in the memory of her father, and it was 11 interconnected gardens, each with a different theme. During her travels, Doris collected art. She eventually cultivated a very expensive collection, which today it is on public display in her former home located in Honolulu, Hawaii. It is said that her collection included works by famed artists Picasso, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, and Monet. She also collected rare wines, and her collection of over 2,000 bottles were estimated to be worth over $5 million. She also loved to collect fine jewelry. After Doris's death, she left her vast estate to her family's charitable organizations. As part of this, Doris's jewelry collection was auctioned off in June of 2004. The sale earned $12 million for the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Now, Barbara's childhood was very different than Doris's. Her father was neglectful and spent most of his time working versus spending it with his daughter. When Barbara was four years old, her mother Edna passed away at the age of 33. Her death was documented as suffocation due to mastoiditis, which is the result of an infection that travels to the mastoid cells of the skull located behind the ear. But the rumor mill said something completely different. Rumors persisted for years that Edna actually ended her own life due to her being depressed about her husband's constant cheating. Four-year-old Barbara was the one who found her mother's body, and this trauma followed her for the rest of her life. After her mother's death, Barbara was shuttled between relatives and was raised by a governess. As soon as she became the age to go to school, Barbara was sent to boarding school. It was here that she became very introverted and had limited interaction with kids of her own age. The person closest to her was her cousin, Jimmy Donahue, who was the son of her mother's sister. Jimmy also inherited a portion of the Woolworth estate and he lived a very chaotic life. As he grew to adulthood, his drug, alcohol, and relationship problems were known to the public, and this embarrassed the family. When Barbara was 18, her family kept with high society tradition and threw her a very lavish debutante ball. This party was attended by the elite of the day, and it was said to cost in today's funds just over a million dollars. Considering that this party was right in the middle of the Depression, this caused public outrage that when so many people were struggling, the Hutton family would spend this amount on one party. The public criticism got so bad that Barbara was sent away to tour Europe to escape the press. Now, just like Doris, Barbara was also a collector. Old master paintings, sculptures, porcelain, expensive jewelry, Barbara had to have it all. One of the most well-known objects that Barbara purchased was jewelry that once belonged to Marie Antoinette and Empress Eugene of France. She also collected very expensive and important pieces from Fabergé and Cartier. The most notable piece of jewelry she had was the Pasha diamond, which was a beautiful 40 karat diamond that was octagonally cut. She decided she didn't like that, so she had it recut into a round diamond bringing it down to 36 carats. So now that you guys know a bit about these ladies' lives, I think that you all likely would agree with me that both of these women lived in separate gilded cages surrounded by bodyguards and servants. This was during a time that the average income per capita was under $2,000 a year. Both of these women were often targets of the press and were given as examples of inappropriate and frivolous spending during a time that most people were struggling to even survive. Barbara and Doris were both part of the same high society social circles and the two met as teenagers. They were friends in their early years and the press dubbed them both as the Gold Dust Twins. Even though the two were friendly, the term twins was a huge exaggeration of their relationship. The two were shuttled between multiple residences, and it was rare that they would settle in one spot for very long. They were always watched by those who cared for them, and this wasn't exactly the best circumstance to build a friendship outside the family. But you know what? The two had something in common. 
They both lived lives that were very different from regular people, and this helped the two forge a very strong bond in their early years. When they were both in their teens, both attended schools for the elite. Barbara was very unhappy during this time. As we mentioned previously, she was an introvert, but she was also very self-conscious due to her weight. This resulted in her developing anorexia, which she battled with for her entire life. Now, Doris, on the other hand, was outgoing and self-confident, and she became a social butterfly. Both ladies went to each other's coming out parties before they both started getting their inheritances. They both started spending their fortunes on lavish homes, jewels, and later on husbands. But this is where the two started to drift apart, after the previously awkward Barbara blossomed into a beautiful swan. The press started publishing her picture alongside the movie stars of the day due to her beauty. This started making Doris very jealous. She also was a beautiful woman, but her features were not considered to be conventionally beautiful by the standards of that time. Even though the two had very different friend groups, some of these friends started to covertly start up a rivalry between the women. Now, Barbara blew her money way more than Doris did. Barbara loved to buy mansions, jewelry, and she also bought a bunch of polo horses. She would give her money away to friends and to those who were hangers-on to her friend group. When she would talk to those around her about Doris, she would call her cheap. In one famous example, actor Errol Flynn was visiting Doris's home. After seeing a huge crystal chandelier in Doris's home, Errol said to her, and I quote, Doris, what are you doing with one of Barbara's earrings? Now, Doris was not impressed. Soon, the trash talk that each lady was doing about the other got back to each to them. As the years passed, the two developed an intense rivalry that was fueled by gossip columnists who were printing any real or imagined slights. The relationship fell apart after Doris decided to invite Barbara to visit her at her Hawaiian home. When there, Barbara decided to redecorate Doris's home. She waited until Doris left her home one day, and when she was gone, Barbara had all of Doris's priceless art and antiques taken out of the home. She replaced them with modern Japanese furnishings and art that was of her taste. Now, as you guys can imagine, when Doris came home, she lost it. She kicked Barbara out, and honestly, I can't blame her at all. After this event, the two no longer trusted each other as their jealousy grew. Most weight loss plans are one size fits all, but Noom builds personal plans that meet your needs. Noom takes into account dietary restrictions, medical issues, and other personal needs to build the plan that works for you. Noom is built for your psychology and your biology. Noom weight uses psychology. That's why they say losing weight starts with your brain, but it also takes into account your unique biological factors, which also affect weight loss success. The program helps you understand the science behind your eating choices and why you have cravings. Everyone's journey is different, so your daily lessons are personalized to you and your goals. Noom helps you build new habits for a healthier lifestyle. To date, Noom has helped more than 5.2 million people lose weight. Noom's flexible program focuses on progress instead of perfection. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M.com. And check out Noom's first ever cookbook, The Noom Kitchen, for 100 healthy and delicious recipes to promote better living. Available to buy now wherever books are sold. Individual results may vary. Visit our website at Noom.com for more information. Did you know that one in five Americans have learned a new language on their bucket list? Yeah, I'm one of them. So how about we make 2024 the year we finally check learning a new language off our list with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. I love Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons that are handcrafted by language experts and real native speakers to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. It's designed for real conversations you'd actually have, like how to ask directions to the best cafe, how to order cheese and wine for lunch and dinner, or maybe that's just important to me, but I know you'll learn what's important to you too. Let's finally cross a language off of our bucket list. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription at babbel.com slash believe. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash believe, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash 
B-L-E-A-V. Rules and restrictions may apply. Visit Babbel.com for terms and details. Doris got married for the first time to James H.R. Cromwell, who was the stepson of a wealthy financier. What she didn't know was that he was a gold digger. Doris used her vast fortune to finance James's political career. After he served for a couple months as the U.S. ambassador to Canada, James made an unsuccessful run for the U.S. Senate. The two had a daughter together who they named Arden. Arden was born prematurely on July 11, 1940, and she passed away the following day. Three years later, the couple divorced. Barbara, on the other hand, got married in 1933 to her first husband, Alexis Midvaney. This man used Barbara's money to his advantage. He was a social climber who claimed that he and his siblings were princes when they fled Europe after the Soviet invasion of the country of Georgia. When the two met, Alexis was already married to one of Barbara's friends. The couple's introduction was no accident. It was engineered by Alexis's sister Isabel, who was pushing her family to marry and divorce as necessary to gain money. Isabel and Alexis came up with a plan that involved Alexis getting a divorce and seducing Barbara. They set it up that when the couple would become intimate, friends would walk in to find Barbara in a compromising position. This would be when Isabel would threaten Barbara that she would ensure that Barbara would have negative publicity if she would not marry Alexis. It worked like a charm, and after Alexis spent millions of Barbara's money, the two were divorced in 1935. It was not long after this that Barbara met her second husband, Count Kurt Hogwitz Hardenberg Reventlow. Now, this marriage was even worse than her last. Kurt controlled Barbara through verbal and physical abuse that resulted in a beating so severe that she was hospitalized. Kurt was jailed for this, but she took him back. Kurt convinced Barbara to give up her American citizenship and get Danish citizenship, which was the country that he was from. She did as he asked, and soon the abuse got so bad that Barbara began to abuse drugs to cope. Even though she was addicted, Barbara gave birth to the couple's only child, Lance, in London. Lance luckily was a healthy baby, but Barbara almost died from complications from giving birth. Now the press, who loved to compare and contrast the two women, jumped on this. They released stories to pit them against each other as rivals, and they happily pointed out that baby Arden passed away while baby Lance was thriving. This only added to the women's hatred towards each other. It was not long after this that Barbara filed for divorce and asked for full custody of Lance. The two had a bitter court battle that resulted in Barbara winning custody, but just like her father did with her, Barbara left Lance to be raised by a series of governesses before he was sent away to boarding school. So what was Barbara doing during this time? She was having love affairs with people like Howard Hughes until she met the man who would be her third husband, actor Cary Grant. But before we dive into that hot mess, Doris got married again during this time. The man she married was legendary Dominican playboy Porofino Rubiosa. So why was he so legendary? It was said that Portofino was extremely well endowed, so much so that in Paris, restaurant workers used to call those tall pepper mills a ruby. But extreme endowment does not make for a good marriage, and this marriage was a complete disaster from the start. A year later, the couple divorced after Doris tried to end her life by cutting her own wrists. In the divorce, the judge ordered Doris to pay her ex-husband what would be in today's funds over half a million dollars per year until he remarried, a fishing fleet off the coast of Africa, multiple sports cars, a B-25 bomber plane, and a 17th century home in Paris. Now, while this was going on, Barbara met Cary Grant on the set of one of his movies, and the couple got married on July 8, 1948. The press dubbed the two as Cash and Cary, even though Cary had money and fame on his own. Even though Cary truly loved Barbara, 
the marriage failed and the two were divorced. Carrie did not ask for or receive any money from Barbara in their divorce settlement. But Barbara wasn't single for very long. After this divorce, she moved to Paris and she started to date Igor Trubitskoy, who was an expat Russian prince that was well known but had very little cash. The two were married in 1948 in Switzerland, and soon afterwards, Igor became a race car driver. He soon filed for divorce, and when he did, Barbara attempted to take her own life. When she did, it made headlines around the world. It was New Year's Day in 1954 when Doris read a newspaper headline, Ruby and Barbara Hutton Wed. Doris snapped, since Ruby was Porofino Rubiosa, her ex-husband. Doris was furious, and she started screaming obscenities and trashed Barbara as her friends tried to console her. She claimed that Barbara was always threatened by her and always wanted to have or take what Doris had. But this marriage didn't last very long. It lasted only 53 days since Barbara found out that Porofino was having an affair with actress Zsa, Zsa Gabor before and during their marriage. When the couple got married, Barbara wrote a check as a wedding gift to her husband that would be worth over $10.5 million today. As a divorce settlement, Barbara gave him a coffee plantation, another B-24 bomber plane, more polo horses, jewelry, and what would be the equivalent of over $23 million in a settlement. Those who were around Porfido at the time knew why he started chasing Barbara. It was because he blew through the settlement that he received from Doris, and he knew that Barbara was fragile and easily manipulated. Barbara's relatives tried to convince her not to marry Portofino. They urged her to call Doris and find out more about the man. Now, Barbara did reach out to Doris and claimed that Doris said her ex-husband was a great companion and a true gentleman, even though she knew what kind of person her ex really was. So after the divorce, Doris was seething. She didn't care that Barbara and her ex didn't work out. She just wanted revenge against Barbara. So she started flirting with Barbara's ex, Cary Grant. Cary, he didn't bite, and this upset Doris even more. So what does a socialite with money to burn and a grudge do? Well, Doris decided to get a bunch of plastic surgeries to make her look younger. After recuperating, Doris started to chase a much younger man, jazz musician Joe Castro. Now, Joe started dating Doris after she phoned him up one day. She reportedly said, and I quote, I'll give you more than she would. If you were with me, you'll have a symphony orchestra. Now, you all can imagine who she actually was. After the two started dating, Doris and Joe ran into Barbara in Tahiti in a restaurant. The two would not acknowledge each other, and they sat on the opposite side of the restaurant from each other. As said by columnist Leonard Leons, who reported on this event, he said in part, and I quote, America's two wealthiest heiresses, like China and the USA, are aware of each other's existence, but do not recognize her. When Doris was dating Joe, Barbara was not single. Her next husband was German tennis star Baron Gottfried von Kram, and this relationship ended in divorce. Next came her seventh husband, Prince Pierre Raymond Dean Vin de la Champasic. Now this also ended in divorce, but that's not why Barbara was constantly being talked about in high society circles. It was because she was now regularly appearing intoxicated in public. Barbara was burning through her cash since she was addicted to both drugs and alcohol. She now expected to be carried everywhere since she was usually so much under the influence that she couldn't even walk. But Doris, she wasn't doing that great herself. In the fall of 1965, Edward T. Rella, who was a handsome interior decorator, was doing some work for Doris in one of her homes. The two were in a car together going back to the home when Edward got out of the car to open the gates of Doris's estate. He left the vehicle running, with an intoxicated Doris having her foot on the car's brake. She took her foot off the brake and put it on the gas. The car quickly jerked forward, crushing Edward against the gates, killing him instantly. The investigation into Edward's death ended with an accidental death ruling. To ensure that Doris would not go through a wrongful death suit, she gave Edward's family the equivalent of just under a million dollars in today's funds. 
When Barbara was asked by reporters for a quote concerning this, she said, and I quote once more, perhaps Doris didn't like his taste. She certainly didn't care for mine. As the years passed, the lady's role in the public eye reversed. Doris's addiction issues aged her and made her appear older than her years. Doris, on the other hand, embodied the public's idea of what a glamorous international judge setter looked like. Barbara's behavior started to become more and more erratic, demanding for people to carry her everywhere. When her son Lance died in a plane crash in 1972, she fell into a deep depression. She had burned through most of her fortune, and questionable deals made by her longtime lawyer drained the rest. She started to liquidate her assets to bring money in to survive, but even so, she still kept giving money away to strangers who would pay attention to her. Barbara spent her final days nearly blind, living in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in Los Angeles, and it was here that she died after she suffered a heart attack. According to one of Barbara's biographers, when she passed away, all that was left of her fortune was $3,500, but some that are close to her say that's not true. She was laid to rest in her family's mausoleum at Woodlawn Cemetery in New York City. Now, Doris's final years were very different than Barbara's. She had countless love affairs and made headlines again after she posted bail for her former friend, Amelda Marcos. Amelda was the first lady of the Philippines from 1965 to 1986, and she wielded significant power after her husband, Ferdinand Marcos, placed the country under martial law. Amelda was notorious for living a lavish lifestyle while she and her husband stole billions of dollars from the people of their country. When the Philippines was suffering from civil unrest, Amelda traveled the world and spent the state's money on her shopping sprees. Doris paid Amelda's bail of $5 million after she was arrested for racketeering. Amelda was convicted and sentenced to prison after being considered one of the greatest plunderers in history. In 1992, at the age of 79, Doris decided that she wanted another facelift. After surgery, she got up to walk. She was heavily medicated and was taking medication prescribed to her as well as taking the antidepressants, painkillers, sleeping pills, and alcohol that she was addicted to. She fell and broke her hip. The following January, she had a knee replacement and had a second knee surgery in July of 1993. A day after she returned home from this surgery, Doris had a stroke. She died in her Los Angeles home, cut off from her friends and associates at the age of 89. But just like in life, Doris's death was full of controversy. In the days before her death, Doris had her will changed to make her butler the executor of her estate. Those that were around Doris at that time claimed that her alcoholic butler, Bernard Lafferty, managed to isolate Doris and fed her drugs. Even though her fortune remained intact, Doris grew paranoid and mistrustful of everyone except for Bernard. After Doris's death, Bernard had her cremated 24 hours later, and because of this, rumors started to swirl claiming that Doris either ended her own life or she was murdered. Why? Well, it's because that Doris had a lot more than $3,500 in the bank. Unlike Barbara, Doris was smarter with her money. She made very smart investments in huge companies like General Motors and had a financial team managing her money. At her death, her net worth was valued at $5.3 billion. But at the end, both Doris and Barbara suffered from the same fate. These two frenemies were bedridden and cut off from their friends and the world. The rivalry between the two was finally over. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. What are your thoughts on the years-long mean girl relationship between Doris Duke and Barbara Hutton? Let us know what you think on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram and threads at Horrifying underscore History, or on X at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast. For when you do, not only do you let other people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. 
It's a great way not to miss our next episode, Horrifying Historical Beauty. If you want to get even more horrifying history, you really need to check out our website. When there, you'll find links to all of our social media and to our YouTube channel that has not just our podcast episodes, but additional history-based videos for you to enjoy. We also have a blog that's filled with spooky topics and episode updates to read up on. And on top of this, this site is the home to our fan club, which has amazing tiers and great perks like your own feed to listen to our show ad-free. It's also the home tour store that's filled with spooky merch that you guys will love. And for our fan club members, you will get a permanent discount in our store for the entire time that you're a fan club member. You can find all on this and more at horrifying-history-shop.fourthwall.com. Thank you all for listening today, and until next time. If you like the show, please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe. It really does help the show to grow. Thank you for listening.